state of the creative un- creative union. What are we even doing here, right? Why are we why are we all joining to to spice up our ad strategy, right? And uh, when Kyle reached out to me about this topic of anti ads and creativity, I was naturally super excited because this is a realm that I've been working in and and am passionate about. But I think I was a little bit scared as well because. I think as many of you would relate, like as a marketer, I feel like I put a lot of myself into my work. And that means that sometimes when the work doesn't work, then I ask myself, well, then do I work? Right? Like, you know, I like, why do I put myself through this? I, I invest so much of my emotional and mental state into a strategy or a thing. And then it's like, well, can I reinvent the wheel? Can I think outside the box? Can I invoke this sense of feeling for someone to create a response that then takes an action, right? Like I'm a fully remote creative marketer. So I sit here at my desk and I look out at my half dead lawn and I try to think about, you know, how to create content that hopefully converts someone by making them feel something, right? And so then I do all that work. And then at the end of the day, it feels like it's just click-through rates and cost per clicks and impressions and leads and data and all this stuff. And then I feel like we kind of lose sight of that thing that makes people feel something, the human experience and how that relates to our ads. Um, So I don't know in the chat, if you're nodding your head right now, then you're in the right place because today we're going to tap into that, the human side of creative marketing and anti-advertising. Okay, so here is what you're up against. The average person is exposed to between 4,000 and 10,000 ads per day. And that's not even taking into account the absolute avalanche of content that's being dumped into our feeds at all times. I'm talking like 46,000 posts are made on Instagram every minute. And almost 4 million YouTube videos are uploaded every single day. Consumers have never been engaged on so many channels and those channels have never been so full of content and advertising but most of it fails to get your attention you'll only actually be consciously aware of a small percentage of those four to ten thousand ads you see in a single day and of that small percentage only a fraction of that will go on into your brain where it can plant a seed that hopefully grows to become a conversion And that's because our brains are wired to tune out stimuli that isn't important. And that's really what allows us to stay focused on what we're doing uh, at different points of the day. If we saw everything and heard everything that was happening around us, we wouldn't get anything done. And obviously a part of this wiring is what we in marketing end up referring to as banner blindness, the ability to tune out advertising without really thinking about it. And This isn't meant to discourage you. It's meant to just show you why cutting through the noise is so important. And like most things, there are right ways and wrong ways of doing that. So first, when you want to be noticed, there's this temptation to just simply do more, turn up the volume. So more ad spend, increasing ad production, targeting a larger audience. And while this might boost impressions, that's not going to be indicative of your message actually breaking through. If you simply do more of the same, you're not cutting through the noise, you're actually just adding to it. And that brings me to my next point. You can't be overly focused on data because that's only telling part of the story. While we all want to draw that line from ad to conversion, think about how many times you've seen an ad like out in the wild and said, nice, or that's clever, or I like that. Those moments might might not turn you into a customer then and there, but they build that brand affinity and you remember these brands. Now, me as a consumer, my clicks are incredibly hard to get. That might sound like a weird flex. Uh, It's not meant to, Um, but I I really don't click on anything. But that said, if next week I wanted to build a website, the first brand that I'm going to look at is Webflow because I love their ads. I can almost recite their ads from memory. I've watched them on YouTube. I actually go out looking for new ads from Webflow. And yet, aside from impressions, Webflow knows nothing about me. They have no data to reflect how close I actually am to becoming a customer. And it's all because of their ad strategy. I love that, Kyle. I literally am sitting here playing the Webflow ad in my... like. What if you could control the web with your mind, yeah. right? Like that it's ad. Right. We, all... we, need, we need an update on that button. Yeah. 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 We, we've seen that ad. I've never clicked on that ad, though, to your point, right? I've just seen it. 
it's in my brain. When I think of creating an easy to design website, I think of Webflow, like it just totally. Uh, maybe on another kind of different medium of consuming ads, uh, probably everyone here has watched the Super Bowl, right? And we all know that what comes with the Super Bowl is the ads, right? And that's the rare occasion, right? Where all these ad teams get to flex something a little bit different. They're trying to like really stand out, right? This is a perfect example of like a bunch of ads side by side lined up on deck and they're all trying to make a huge impact, right? And if you think about it, this is a unique moment where these brands can push these boundaries and it's probably the most eyeballs they're going to have all year, right? And so why don't they just play it safe? They can't afford not to, right? Because they just spent millions of dollars for this 15 second ad slot, right? And they have to then swing for the fences, right? To prove that ROI. They can't just play it safe. But then that begs the question for me, why can't I do that in my ads? Why can't I have that same mentality, right? Like I'm not producing the Super Bowl, but I may be trying to have like Super Bowl sized results for a campaign. And so each ad should be that opportunity to make a real lasting impact with your audience. Um, so that, that's, I can't stress enough then this point, which is your audience is eagerly waiting for you to surprise and delight them. Now that may not seem like a natural thing when we're thinking about like, oh, conversions and this and that, like, but whether you know it or not, your audience is eagerly waiting for this. They're hungry for it. Like if you think about humans, we're wired for curiosity. And when we experience something novel or new, interesting, different, it leaves that lasting impression on us. And so if you can surprise and delight them, you're going to actually awaken something inside of them. So speaking of Super Bowl, let's maybe start with, I would say the most popular anti-ad that spiced up the Super Bowl last year, probably seen by millions. Uh, I think everyone was left with a lasting impression after this one. Welcome back to Super Bowl 57. So far, Greg, the game going like you expected? Yeah, and so far, these teams, they've really... So, good. so if you haven't seen that ad before, that was produced by Tubi, which is a you know TV streaming platform. And it pretty much won the Super Bowl because it during a commercial break, it emulated coming back to the game, right? And think about how disrupting that would be if you were watching the most important football game of the year and this thing kind of like interrupts the game, right? When you're watching a sporting event and the ads come up, what do you do? You go get, grab a drink, you go to the restroom. And if you're over in the kitchen and you hear the Super Bowl theme song play and the announcers start to talk about it, what are you going to do? you're gonna come back into the living room and watch the TV and pay attention, right? So now you're back at the TV and all your attention's there, but then this menu pops up and the Tubi app select and they're scrolling through library of movies. And after one, then Tubi brand takes over and then you're kind of like left with this, like you're pointing at someone across the room and stop sitting on the remote and like only to realize that you've been played by Tubi, literally, well played, right? So. I personally experienced this watching the Super Bowl this year, and I can say five months later that that is the only ad that I remember from the Super Bowl. But why do you think that is? It's because of that experience, right? Like it broke the cycle, it disrupted familiarity, and it made an entire room of people stop and pay attention, which that's not easy to do. No, so that idea of breaking the cycle and going against what's familiar, uh, if we go back a couple of decades, to Volkswagen, this ad campaign, the Think Small campaign, is viewed by many as sort of the pioneer of anti-advertising. Everything about these ads went against what people were expecting to see from a car company. Uh, even the fact that it was printed in black and white, like these were shown in full color magazines. And so at the time, this approach would have been seen as absolutely insane, but that's what actually makes it successful in grabbing the attention of its audience. And the brains behind this campaign, his name was Bill Burnback, uh, reportedly said that creativity was an unfair advantage a company could use against its competition. And while other ad agencies would rely on cold research, 
creativity could really be that difference maker. And I feel like that's actually even more true today when we're living in this time where there is just so much saturation, there's more competition than ever before. Brands are entirely um, obsessed with data at this point, but it's really creative ads. The ones that are trying something new that are the ones that actually break through. Like this ad from Hinge. Yeah. Uh, the, I, th Hinge wants you to meet someone great. Even if it kills us. Because when you find the real thing, you won't need us anymore. Which is kind of the point. Hinge. The dating app designed to be deleted. Brilliant. Yeah. I love this example because, right, I just, you picture yourself in like the pitch room for this ad, right? And the marketing guy stands up and says, hey, everyone, I have the next great idea. We're going to show our mascot app icon slowly getting destroyed over time. We're never going to show anybody using the app that took millions to develop, by the way, right? And we won't show the faces of people using it. And then at the end, we'll finish by the ad, with the ad telling people it's meant to be deleted. Like, that's just not a normal pitch for an ad, right? And so you'd have many people in that room, right, shaking their head going, you're an idiot, right? But those are probably the people that are still stuck on this rinse and repeat cycle of mediocre marketing, wandering on a treadmill of ARR apathy, right? Like... That, that ad is finishing by literally saying like the app designed to be deleted, right? Because the value that that brings is they just provided you a lasting relationship and you'll never need this app again, right? But the whole value prop is tied up in the fact that they're saying, get rid of this app, right? Um, and so I just, I just love that example. Okay, so some of you are probably sitting there thinking like, that's great for Volkswagen, that's great for Hinge but I work for like a medical device company or I work for cybersecurity and my industry is literally where creativity goes to die. Well, what if I told you that that's all the more reason to step up your creativity? B2B is boring, um, but that actually makes it a lot easier for us to stand out because there's no one else being creative. If we're the ones to do it, it's, it's easy to get results. And to that, uh, we're going to talk about how I've done that at Superside. But first, we're going to talk about how Nolan has done that at Chili Piper. Yeah, I like to say that B2B stands for boring to boring or boring to businesses, right? Because it's so true, Kyle. There's so many things that like, it, there's so many brands that just they put it up on social media and say, build it and they will come. Mm -hmm. but what they're building doesn't make you care, right? And so mm -hmm. um, let's talk about a few examples that we've done at Chili Piper that have uh, helped, I guess, people care more, uh, that disrupted the feed a little bit. Um, this first one's called Notably Excited Nolan. This is uh, kind of an anti-ad strategy that we've tried this year and saw really great results with. Um, some of the goals here would be um, just to give some product education, in an unconventional format in a way that feels um, semi-native to the feed and that we actually show the product and we don't just talk about it. I consider myself a pretty excitable guy. So when I doubled my inbound conversion rates with Chili Piper, I was jumping for joy. Here's how you can do it too in less than 15 seconds. Step one, go to chilipiper.com and click get a demo. Step two, fill out your details. Step three, use Chili Piper's form concierge to perfectly schedule a meeting that fits right within your schedule instantly. I couldn't be more excited for you to double your inbound conversion rates. So there you go, right? So let's start with the why. Why would we create an ad like that? Well, we're bombarded with ads. Back to Kyle's point, 4,000 to 10,000 ads a day, and we don't even retain all of them, right? So how could we create maybe an ad that people would better retain? A lot of ads are full of just hype and excitement. Okay, let's do the opposite of that. Sometimes anti-ads, it's doing the opposite of what everyone else is doing, right? It's an anti-ad. And so um, I think probably as a slightly jaded marketer, I wanted to create something countercultural to what I'm seeing all day. Um, so like, what if I strip all the hype away 
of the person, you know, people get on camera and they go, this is going to change your life. This is awesome. Blah, 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 blah. Right. What if we take that hype, put it aside and we put all the hype on the value the product brings. And then we kind of contrast that with this person or character that thinks they're really enthusiastic and is super excited about everything, but has like the energy level of a dead leaf or something. <laughs> I don't know. Right. But again, back to those goals, right? Short product education. That was a 15, 20 second video, but you saw the entire value prop of Chili Piper's form concierge and how it works. Right. And then like we talked about hype and um, like it, it wasn't hype. It, there's no music. There's just some cuts, some subtitles. And then the energy is dialed back, right? It isn't hype. It's not in your face. Um, so maybe the how would be, you know, I think I talked about it, doing the opposite of what everybody else is doing. Once I had that concept of the character or the thing that I wanted to achieve with it, now I had these limitations to write some scripts around it. And now I'm able to actually create variants of this ad, or I'm able to apply this kind of format or framework to other ad strategies, right? Um, these limit limitations, I love talking about limitations because they help you hone your ideas down, right? If you're um, just sitting in a room and you just say a bunch of ideas, which we'll talk about later in the brainstorming section of this, is like, how do you hone down your ideas into ones that actually work, right? And so sometimes limitations help you kind of refine your idea to, to create something that matters. And like, this was filmed on an iPhone, just like, not super complicated, right? <laughs> like filmed on an iPhone in my home office. And I think that also plays into a little bit of like disrupting the feed where a lot of B2B ads are filmed with millions of dollars of equipment and setups. And, and this feels a little bit more native around the influencer marketing world. Um, so I think that there's something around somebody's face being filmed on mobile. I think it, it already breaks the, the, the ad a little bit that you'd you know, be used to seeing. Um, another example would be, um, which sorry, Kyle mentioned, you know, if you're in medical device companies, you know, sorry if you're here and now we're about to make fun of you. Um, this was an ad that um, we created last year and we wanted to spoof a medical ad, right? We're, we're used to seeing the thing on TV that's, you know, it's going to cure everything, but also there's all these negative side effects. So what if we could do that and flip it on its head? Do you or a coworker suffer from a leaky funnel? Are you embarrassed by lower than normal inbound conversion rates? Have you tried quitting spreadsheets in the past, but are unable to break the habit? Then ask a Piper today about getting a demo of Chili Piper, the only revenue team approved solution proven to increase your inbound conversions and accelerate revenue. Studies have shown Chili Piper can stop your funnel from leaking as soon as you launch. Customers have experienced a 50% increase in conversion rates, while others reported feeling a greater I sense of freedom after videos. quitting spreadsheets. Hi, I'm Dr. Barrows, and I prescribe Chili Piper to all of my clients, and so should you. Side effects of using Chili Piper include, but are not limited to having a spicier outlook on life, long lasting euphoria from exceeding quota, getting promoted, booking more qualified meetings, an overall sense of bliss while your CRM is automatically populated, increased pipeline and crying tears of joy. Talk to a Piper today about a Chili Piper plan that's right for you. So there you go, right? So familiar concept, we've all seen ads like that. And it, it, back to like filming on an iPhone, this ad was really low cost to produce. This is all stock footage, a Fiverr voiceover, and just some time editing. Um, but you know, it's not as simple as that, right? The devil's in the details sometimes. And uh, we had a lot of fun with the script for this. And you saw a bunch of like fine print at the bottom of the video. Like if you go find the full video on YouTube, like you can read some of that like fine print because in those medical ads, you always see all these little like fine print of they're making this claim, but then they're having to back up something at the bottom. So we use that copy as a canvas to create a bunch of irony and kind of, you know, humor. Um, but we knew that, you know, if people were hooked from the concept at the beginning, they would they'd make it through to the end of the end of the video. Um, and, and so we ran that as a YouTube pre-roll ad, just because again, you see those similar ads in the YouTube pre-roll, but we targeted um, our persona. 
and so that was a lot of fun to a lot of fun to produce. And then uh, something I know we shared some video examples, but here's something a little bit different. Um, I wanted to quickly share this this GIF. Um, we wanted to create what they call a scroll stopper, right? You're in your feed, you're scrolling all day long. What's something that will stop your scroll? We were actually inspired by Superside. Um, a few years ago, Superside had their mascot Astro Pup in a timeline, and it was kind of floating around in the timeline, interacting with different UI elements in you know Facebook and Instagram. And we wanted to come up with our own spin on it. So I really didn't overcomplicate this. I just again, put my phone on my desk. I wrote on a piece of paper with a Sharpie and just like double your inbound conversion rates with Chili Piper, slapped a real sticker of our logo I had on it. I didn't even print it. I don't know why. I just taped it to a piece of paper. And then I just like held this thing up against the wall and then dropped it in After Effects and quickly just rough. It's not even a perfect, you know, mask or anything like that. And there's something to that again, because one, this is totally taking over your timeline. Um, I kind of put it side by side here so you could see what was the GIF and what was the post. So the GIF itself is on the left. And then you can see how we shared that in a post on LinkedIn and how that kind of embeds. So it looks like two posts, but it's really a image of a post within a post. And then the sign comes up over the bottom of the comments and the likes and stuff like that. And so that's something that breaks. The, that's going to stop the scroll. But then again, it doesn't feel super produced or flashy or anything like that. It's kind of rough and ready, if you will. Um, and yeah, people were really responsive to it. So let's talk about the results really quickly, right? Um, so this is great, but what are the results, right? On the notably excited Nolan, the LinkedIn post on the left, you can see um, this was shared from my personal account. It got 12,000 impressions, over 3,300 views, over 522 minutes viewed, which is crazy for a 21 second video. Um, and they're not the most viral numbers, right? But, you know, it's important to know, like, we didn't put any paid spend behind that. That's just from my personal account, which at the time probably only had like 2,000 people connected to it. So like for a B2B SaaS, you know, video demonstrating our product from a personal account, I consider that a, a big win because we were able to reach an audience bigger than what I have and um, the, the impressions and everything like that, it speaks for itself. Uh, we did another variant on the right. You can see the YouTube metrics for a notably excited Nolan. We ran as a YouTube pre-roll ad. Um, and you can see that in the top right of the screenshot there, um, that a 20 second ad, which reached 3000 people on average had a 95% retention rate. And then after the, you know, five second skip button came up, 45% of those people were still sticking around at the end. So what does that tell me? They were hooked on the concept and over half of everyone that was watching that ad stayed through, through, you know, and they wanted to watch something else, but they're choosing to watch this video. Um, same with the side effects video at the bottom there. Uh, we ran that as a pre-roll ad, like I said, 22,000 views, and we saw a 76% retention rate on a minute long video, right? Um, and the data tells me again, the concept hooked them, retained them through the ad, and they chose not to hit skip a lot of the time. So that's a great temperature check. It's a measure of success. And another great measure of success, I'd say, for ads are the comments that people leave. And so at Superside, we've done something that I think is quite special. We've managed to consistently put out ads that people actually enjoy. And more often than not, our ads are bringing in comments like the ones you see here. And for the next few slides, I'm going to unpack why I think that is and sort of share what our creative recipe is behind our advertising. But First, uh, I do have to acknowledge that while I'm the guy that's on this webinar and I'm the face in a lot of the ads that you see, uh, there's 12 other people contributing to the ideas that we put out. Uh, each month we get together for an ads brainstorm where everyone brings different ideas to the table and we build off of each other's ideas and it's really where uh, everything gets started. But uh, for the next couple of slides, I'll talk about my sort of recipe. And for me personally, there are three things that I try to consider when coming up with creative ad ideas, starting with ad placement. Uh, so next slide, please. Um, now, hopefully this is a bit of a fresh take on the placement topic. Um, when it comes to social ads, one thing I'm conscious of is the fact that 
as marketers, we're essentially showing up to a party that we weren't invited to. No one's on social media hoping to find stuff from a brand. So sticking with this party metaphor, the first thing that I think about is what are people doing at the party? Are they dancing? If so, then I need to bring music. If they're raging, then I need to bring a bunch of drinks. Wherever I'm advertising, I want to think about what people are doing there and align myself with that. Because if I show up to the party and just start forcing my agenda, no one's going to want me there. No one's going to talk to me and my ads are inevitably going to fail. So with that, uh, let's hit play and watch this ad. How do you professionally say, I won't be able to design your ads by tomorrow because it's 7 p.m. and guess what? I'm still at the office. Is the deadline flexible? I'll need more time to deliver top quality work. Is the deadline flexible? I'll need more time to deliver top quality work. Uh, okay, how do you professionally say it's like a rectangle with some text, not the friggin' Mona Lisa? For these designs, we need to prioritize speed over quality. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. Don't need to reinvent the wheel? <laughs> Do you have a death wish? Okay, well then how do you professionally say, if you had any If you need quality creative done fast, try Superside. Yeah, that's probably bad. With this ad, we built so on good. top of the concept that we found on TikTok and then infused that with the themes that are central to our audience. and. As Nolan talked about earlier, we styled it to look more like a post that your friend might share instead of looking like an ad. And as a result, uh, this one generated over 200 booked calls and almost 500 shares on an ad. So good. 500 shares is crazy. That's amazing. That's amazing. Yeah. And it brought in a ton of positive comments like the three that you see here. And it's safe to say, Kyle, probably that ad surprised and delighted a lot of people which is I would why say so. you would feel excited to share it, right? If, if people are sharing your ad, it's because they either think it's a great idea of an ad or it's just, it, it surprised them. And they're like, wow, you got to check this out too. So props and, on and that. And what you just said, like that aligns with this whole like house party thing. Like people are on social media quite often. Like, what do you do on social media? Me, myself, I find posts, I share them with yep. my friends. And yep. so if you can give that to your audience, if you can create the post that someone might say, hey, my buddy's in design or marketing and might find this funny, your ad's going to be successful. You are going to break through. So uh, with this ad, uh, okay, so styling your Instagram ad to look like an Instagram post, that's not the same as just looking like every other ad that you'd see on Instagram or on TikTok. You want to fit in with the content that people want to see, but you still want to stand out from the ads that you're competing against. And one way to do that is by playing off of what other brands are doing. So with that, uh, let's hit play. I'm Kyle and I am a designer. I've always been creative. Growing up, I'd spent hours and hours drawing. Now I spend hours and hours designing digital ads for Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and all the other platforms. And honestly, I love it because design is a communication tool. Like when I design the, the banner of an email, that's literally the start of a communication because it's at the top of the email. And it's great because I get to collaborate with other designers and, and marketers who evidently are designers too. So they, they didn't go to design school, did they? No, no. They, you know, they say, do what you love and you'll never work a day in your life. I say, do what you love and you'll never take vacation because <laughs> you'll just love it so much. I got so much work to do. Oh my God. You know, you can just hire Superside to help you out, right? What's that? Superside? Yeah. They're a fast, reliable design service that supports internal creative teams. Are, are they any good? Well, I mean, yeah, they're used by big companies like Shots. We can and Amazon. just pause it there or put on mute to play out but um so that ad is obviously playing off of the sort of like employee branding type video that you've probably seen on linkedin or on company websites where everybody working for this company absolutely loves their job 
And as the viewer kind of like tune out and you start playing that game where you're like, I wonder if that person actually works for the company or if that's just a paid actor. And I wonder if that line is scripted or if that's legit. Um, we wanted to do a similar video that obviously as it goes on, takes a bit of a dark turn to sort of lampoon the very type of video that we're emulating um, to call out everything that's sort of become cliche with that type of advertising. And this one was shared over a hundred times on Instagram, which again, uh, pretty awesome that people are sharing an ad that we put out because people don't typically watch ads all the way through, let alone share them with people themselves. And uh, with that, we'll go on to the next slide. Uh, my next ad principle is that really anything can be an ad as long as it connects back to your audience or your offering. And uh, in the most extreme example of this, this is one of my favorite ads because of the origin of the idea. I mentioned this ads brainstorming meeting that we have one month, someone came to the table and they just didn't have any ideas and the lack of an idea ended up being the idea. Um, so with that, let's uh, hit play and just watch this ad. Okay. Let's hear those ad ideas. People, what do you got? So this is just the first draft, but I'm really excited with where it's going. Uh, I got a couple different variations. I'm really excited to hear what to say about it. I think you guys are really interested in this Uh, so this is my idea. It's a, a, a dog. He's a, he's skateboarding. And um, okay, how did you all get fully designed ads? Like Creative Swamp. Who who helped you? So Amazing. I feel like most of us have experienced that at some point in our careers where you show up to the meeting and you realize that you're completely underprepared compared to everybody else. And I think that's why this ad works is because we're tapping into something visceral, something that's deeply personal um, that a lot of people can identify with. Um, at that moment in the meeting, when you realize that you're underprepared, like that seems like the biggest thing. So if we can call that out and connect with people on that emotion and on that experience, we're breaking through. Um, so with that, we'll move on to the final ad example that I have from us at Superside. Um, and this brings me to my last creative ad principle, connecting with the person rather than the employee. Um, I think in B2B, a lot of people have kind of seen the light that B2B is still just business to person, but I think we can push it a lot further as B2B marketers in that that person that we're marketing to is not just their job title or their job description or their KPIs. That's a person that thinks and feels things. And so when I think about my B2B audience, I'm not thinking about what they do at work. I'm thinking about them after work. I'm thinking about them when they, they get home and they're venting about their day to their partner. Like that's the version of them that I want to be connecting with because that's when they're being authentic. And um, in this ad that you're about to see, we generated over 1,200 leads in a month. And I think a big part of that is because we're tapping into that like personal experience rather than what's honestly the cliche experience, like the low hanging fruit of marketing to designers on like their very basic pain points. We're tapping into something that's deeply personal that probably doesn't um, expose itself at work. It comes out after work when that designer is at the bar with their friends talking about their day. So with that, let's hit play and check this one out. Good morning, design team. Open up, Trudy. Of course not. What do you need? Well, I'm launching a new campaign in four weeks and I need five ads. I sent you a brief with all the sizes and platforms. I invited you to a kickoff meeting on Friday, and I included some references for a little inspo. Not that you geniuses need it. I'll get out of your hair. Let me know if you need anything. Thanks. Oh, no, he didn't forget anything. It's all so reasonable. What is going on? Yeah, I just sent them supersized design dysfunctions guide. It reveals how brands like Shopify are bridging the gaps between marketing so, and design. As I say, like, so good. I'm not trying to connect with the designer at work. I'm trying to connect with the designer when they're out with all of their designer friends after work 
and they're talking about that jerk from marketing that does terrible briefs. They're not sitting around talking about a frictionless design briefing experience. They're talking about the person from marketing who doesn't know how to do anything and, and it ruins their day. It pisses them off. That's the conversation that I'm trying to tap into with my ads. Um, I want to tap into where the emotion is, not just like where we're buttoned up and sitting in the boardroom, getting paid to feel a certain way or do a certain thing. And so uh, I'll end uh, this part of the uh, chat with, with this comment, which is, I think my favorite comment that we've received on any of our ads, I've never felt so seen. That's exactly what we're trying to do. I want Superside customers to feel like we're the brand that gets mo them more than anybody else. And really like that's what we're trying to do because that is what builds a bridge between us and our customers is seeing them, not just as a, a company, as an employee, but as people. It's such a good point, Kyle, because like, it seems like oversimplification to say, right, like make people feel seen, right? But totally. that's the point of an ad, right? And sometimes mm -hmm. we get so lost in the campaign and the goal and how to make the product sound cool or different. Like, but at the end of the day, the ad itself in its form needs to make someone feel seen so that they actually relate to the problem, the product, the solution, whatever it is. So it's, it's, it's like, it's almost like we need to go back to the basics sometimes and just go, totally. how does this ad make someone feel when they see it or consume it? And contextualizing when they see and when they see and consume it, right? At the bar with their friends on their phone rather than, I don't know, sitting at their work buried in work. They might not see this ad. It's mm -hmm. so good. Something that I think about a lot when I'm writing an ad or coming up with an idea for an ad is I don't want people, like because we're in B2B and obviously like the services that we're selling relate to what people do in their careers. I don't want someone to like my ad because they're kind of getting paid to like my ad. Like, I don't want someone to like my ad because it delivers something that helps them in their job. I want them to just like my ad as a piece right. of content, as a person. Yep. That's so good. Yeah. So then maybe everyone's listening to us talk about the ads we've made and then they're like, well, this is great for you, but I work at this company and they don't think very creatively, but I want to help like inspire some creativity, right? How can I be the change I want to see in a boring, we have B2B world here, but we could say just advertising world or marketing strategy world, right? Like how, how can I be the change? So we're going to talk about really quickly here. So how, do, how can you set a creative culture, right? Sometimes, you know, culture isn't, culture just doesn't start, right? A, a, a great saying is culture is caught, not taught. You can't teach culture, but people can catch the culture, right? And so how could you be a champion of creative culture in your um, organization or department? So what can you do? This is for Kyle. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I don't want to. No, that's okay. slide. Yeah. So um, three things that I think about in kind of setting a creative culture, and I'm not going to fly through this because we want to leave enough time for a decent Q&A. Um, the main thing that I'm going to touch on here is uh, that first one, be the martyr of bad ideas. Um, mm -hmm. At Superside, I, I think some people know me as the guy who comes up with the most out of nowhere, uh, wacky ideas. And that's intentional. Um, I want to, what I kind of see as like set the floor for creative mm -hmm. ideas. You want to create a safe space for people to come up with ideas. And that's not as easy as just saying there are no bad ideas. Sometimes it means being the person to say those ideas and let people know that you can do that and, and you'll be okay. I kind of think of it as like cliff jumping. You need to be the person who jumps off the cliff first because when people see you surface and swim away unharmed, they're more likely to jump. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't just say, hey, you'll be fine. You need to prove it. And sometimes that means coming up with some ideas that might make you look ridiculous, might make you look like you're in the wrong meeting. Um, and then the other one that I'll just touch on here is like sharing inspiration at Superside. We're always posting ads that we see uh, to Slack. And it's always like other companies that we think are really cool and doing really neat, creative things. And I kind of think like a lot of companies probably do this. And you got to ask mm -hmm. yourself, like, like, why aren't we that company? Like we can be the company that's making the thing 
that the other company is sharing on Slack. Like, why not us? Yeah, that's a great goal. That's a great goal to set, like for you and your team, is how can we make ads that are super shareable that people want to put in their swipe file? That's a point I have on here too. Um, you know, how, how, you know, how can you foster this creative culture? You know, something that's been a huge hack for me is I have this note on my phone that's available on my work laptop, my personal laptop, my phone, anywhere I am, I have this note and I drop ideas as they come to me in this note. And that's been a huge unlock for me because I'll think of something when I'm brushing my teeth or <laughs> when I'm out on a walk, or I may have something kind of come into my head. And so if I just quickly jot it down, I'm setting my future self up for a win when I either need a new idea or I need to create a content calendar or I need to infuse something with a little bit more spice, I guess, if you will. Um, that's been a huge, huge help for me. Um, I also test ideas on my personal account. What's great about this is it takes some of the pressure off the branded account. If you're trying to push for uh, a creative idea in your organization, like, just offer to post it from your personal account first so that the pressure isn't, oh, but what's this going to do to our, you know, brand account? You know, we did this with Notably Excited Nolan. We shared it on uh, my account first, like I shared the results from. And we allowed to prove that and see if it would resonate before we shared it to Chili Piper's like 56,000 LinkedIn followers, right? So we're just like doing kind of a like a ramp up to see if that is going to resonate. Um, like Kyle said, create a Slack channel, something we do at Chili Piper. We have a hashtag great marketing Slack channel. And that just creates this amazing place where people kind of crowdsource these ideas and we comment on them and we dissect them. Sometimes they're positive. Sometimes they're like not great ads. And we go, why didn't this work? So sometimes it's like the not great marketing channel too. It, it can be both, right? Um, it's important to look at wins and failures and understand why. Um, and if you don't use Slack or you work solo, like just start a bookmark folder and just save pages into it. Um, like create a swipe file for the best ideas that stand out to you. Um, this one's super fun. Do a crazy eights brainstorm. So if you use Figma, there's a template built for this in the templates folder. But if you don't, it's really easy to do anyway. So you get as many people as you want into a brainstorm and each person does eight different ideas in eight minutes. And this has been really helpful for us. We just did this a few weeks ago at Chili Piper. We had six people on the call and we walked away with 48 new unique ideas. Not all of them are going to end up obviously shipping, but it's gotten us a lot further than just one or two ideas in just a brainstorm that didn't have any structure. And that kind of comes to my last point here, which is become a great facilitator of creative meetings. If you want to set that culture and you want to represent the creative culture, become a great facilitator. When you're brainstorming, I'm sure everyone's been on that call where like you're brainstorming and then like it's free flowing and then you kind of get to the end of the meeting and it's like, well, now what? We have a bunch of ideas, but they're kind of all over the place and we don't have any clarity. Without a facilitator, there's a real lack of clarity, right? But if you have somebody that's kind of helping keep the agenda moving, writing down the ideas, taking notes, and bringing it back to the goal, that's that's what's going to help it actually be a productive. Because sometimes brainstorming meetings just become a brainstorming meeting and not a brainstorming meeting with like next steps and actions on it. So become a great facilitator of that. Um, and like Kyle said, be be the person that creates that safe space for no bad ideas. Like Kyle said, sometimes you need to break the ice and just put all the bad ideas out there, the obvious elephants in the room, so that people feel free to share. But also, if you're a leader and you want to help your team um, you know, open up and share more ideas, sometimes they're a little bit afraid because, frankly, they're probably worried about being fired if they have a bad idea, right? And so if you're a leader and you can like allow your team to have this safe space, you might unlock things that you would have never thought of, but they're thinking of, but they're afraid to share, right? Um, so I think probably the last point then that I would share that probably recaps all of this, um, the best result from an anti-ad probably is that you live rent-free in someone's head, you know, long after you, um, you know, after you've seen an ad, it lives rent-free, rent right? We talked about at the beginning, metrics, ROI, data, they're important to measure. Like Kyle sh said, like shares and um, different engagement metrics. But like, they're not always the most important metric when it comes to creating ads that stand out, right? Sometimes I see an ad and I have no intention of clicking on it, but I still remember it. We talked about tons of examples like that. But you might be saying now like, Nolan, I can't measure if someone remembers something 
or shares it with a friend or told their partner about it. I can't, I can't measure that, right? And to that, I say, you're totally right. You, you're 100% correct. But to me, I think the ultimate goal is something else. And it's not measurable. It's not attributable. Don't tell your CMO that. But the goal, I think, is that it is a neurological, emotional, physical impact left inside someone's mind. And to me, that's the greatest accomplishment I can get is if I can actually make that imprint in someone's head. Because um, I know if I can achieve that, then they'll remember the ad and the brand and the way it probably made them feel when the timing is just right. I'm not worried about if they're going to convert now. I'm just worried if they're going to remember me when the time is right. Um, so sometimes that best result is that it lives rent free in their head. That's all I got. So I think now, uh, Darren will invite you back and, uh, we can get into some questions. Let's do it. Yes. Hi guys. It was super interesting. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed it. We've got, um, a couple of really interesting questions from the audience. So I'm trying to kind of sort them here as best I can, but I think we'll start with Kelly. And Kelly says, when testing ideas from your personal account, do you include the brand slash product info? If not, how do you know if the ad actually works? Yeah. So I think, um, I definitely do. Because I don't think there's anything wrong with you know tagging the brand account. You're at the end of the day, you're showing the brand product, anyways. Um, so I definitely do. And you could still have your marketing team create a UTM link and put it in the comments and see if those you know you could track those clicks if you want. Um, I don't see anything wrong with with associating from the personal account. It's more of the when you post something from from the brand account, you're kind of putting it up and saying, "Hey, here's our thing." But if you do it from a personal account from your own. It's kind of like it's going to your network, you're testing the waters and you can see how it resonates. I think there's also like a micro version of that that you can use that's a little maybe like less risky. Uh, mm -hmm. If you do want to include like the brand and everything is just try things out on Slack, like try it within your company first. Um, totally. And then like if, if people like it, if people believe in it from there, um, you can try it as like an organic post to your brand's social accounts before you open it up to that like wider audience that you're paying for. Um, you can, if, if you have something that's like pretty risky, you can slowly level it up. I know at SuperSide we use like test audiences as well, as well before mm -hmm. we do like the big launch for our ads. Um, and that allows us to see like, where are some of the comments coming in? Is this hitting like we want it to hit before um, we really uh, deliver and like full send it? And I think, I think an interesting grow on this is something that Tawny asks, which is, what platforms give you the best ROI on B2B ads? That's a loaded question, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if there's a right answer, Kyle. I don't know if you have anything. Um, yeah, I so like for, for this conversation, I wasn't really prepared to get into like that level of results. I showed the slide with the 12 other people uh, who work on our ads. There is yeah. a couple people on that slide that are much more equipped to answer that question than myself. So I'm not going to uh, blow smoke or like uh, I, give you an answer for the sake of giving an answer. And I think I think the last one here that kind of talks to distribution, Andrew asks, do you see benefits from posting to your personal accounts over company accounts? So obviously you talked about testing there, but do you actually see better performance or different performance depending on which account you post from? Totally. I mean, at the end of the day, if we strip everything away, B2B, B2C, whatever, it's humans. We're all humans. It's people selling to people through businesses, through brands, through accounts, right? And like, they, if I personally feel like this is a little bit of a projection, but I personally feel like the future is people brands representing the overarching brand because mm -hmm. if you have five different personas at your in your marketing team or at your company and you build up those personal brands with their network you're tapping into a much more authentic you know group of people than a wide net from a brand account the brand account always serves a purpose but i think the future is people following the head of sales or the creative director of video services or the senior creative copywriter and doing content to that audience from that person representing the overarching brand, because that's more authentic than a logo on a, on a company page. 
the only thing I'll add is is really just that I, I think people are always going to be more likely to engage with a person than they are just a logo. Totally. I mean, statistically, um, people interact with a face better than just a graphic. And that alone, right, plays back into like the anti ads. And it's that whole thing, right? Human connection again. Like you're even if you're doing B two B content, you're ultimately talking to a human at the other end of that mm -hmm. communication, and you're trying to connect emotionally. And that kind of links really nicely to something that um, Caitlin has asked, which is when you're going through the kind of conscious um, uh, kind of practice of connecting with people. How do you handle that when it's in a more emotionally charged? space how do you make the ads attractive but still authentic and kind of i i kind of have had some thoughts on that but it would be interesting really interesting to hear what you guys think i if, if i'm understanding the question correctly uh, it's like how how do we come up with an idea that we think will emotionally engage someone i think i think it's like more delicate so, you know, more delicate subject matter or more delicate communications. Do you do you apply a different rationale to those when you're developing for that rather than something where hume is probably a more appropriate tool? Mm. Okay, I think a so, good example uh, of that. Oh, go ahead, Kyle. No, no. I was going to say a, probably a, a really great example of that was the anti-Semitism ads that came up, which was like the blue square that would come up on your TV, and like. It broke your focus. If you if you haven't seen it, look up like the blue square anti Semitism ad. Like, mm. and and you were watching TV and it would come up, and it you it totally disrupted the being. It was like really chill and it was quiet and it like put up these like words and all this stuff about racism and all these things and it like made you stop and go, whoa, what is this? And after it's over, you go, oh wow, and then it just totally breaks your focus. But it's not humor based. It's not irony based. It's still it's breaking. The, it's just anti ads are just going against what everything else looks like or sounds like, I think. I think something to think about as well, like this idea of relating emotionally um, in a way that uh, like might be like risky. We saw during COVID, like how many companies came out with like COVID ads and uh, like, did anyone like, I, I can't think of any that like really stood out as being like, oh, wow, that was great. Um, they all kind of hit the same notes and at least with with my approach to advertising i like to think about like the small the small moments so like i showed with like the ad that was based on like not having any ideas i think those small moments are a bit more powerful because that gets deeper into that idea of like seeing your audience and, and making them feel seen it's very easy to just be like COVID's happening COVID ad mm -hmm. Um, or like uh, sociocultural things like going on. Let's hit on that. Um, that's kind of like the low hanging fruit. And I think oftentimes those things can come off as inauthentic. Uh, they can come off as highly strategic, um, partially because you see a lot of people doing them. Um, yeah, I, I, I think I think the most success with like this sort of emotional approach, as I say, is like those those smaller moments that take a bit more energy to kind of pinpoint. Sure. And I think it's like it's that whole thing again, circling back to what you guys were saying about ultimately you're talking to humans, right? So as long as you feel connected to what the human truth of this thing is then you can be confident in the way you're talking about it. You just need to make sure you understand your subject matter really well, I think. Totally. Yes. And something like that, <laughs> does, something that does help me personally with understanding my audience and subject matter is uh, like, I, I am on a creative team. A lot of our audience are creatives. And before I was on a creative team, I worked for a marketing agency on like the account management side. So I've held positions um, that kind of cater to our two main audiences. So I've gone through uh, those pain points. I, I've I've lived that day in, day out. I've been a part of those candid conversations after work talking about the crappy marketer or the crappy designer. Um, so it's a lot easier for me to tap into because I'm kind of pulling from my own experiences. And that yeah, goes back to the personal brand, right? Personal brand yeah. representing the arching overarching brand because Kyle, you can share content to your audience 
authentically because you've lived, you've walked the walk, right? Mm -hmm. And so you can create content that talks the talk, right? That people yeah. will resonate with. Um, and I think we've got time for one more super quick one. So I can see a question here from Cole who asks, do you ever break branding guidelines to differ your content more? So how liberal are you on those kind of platforms, I guess? I know our mm. creative director is on, on the call, so I'm, I'm going to watch what I say. <laughs> but any sort of like guidelines, like I kind of think of, of brand guidelines in the same way that I look at like correct grammar when it comes to writing, like poetry, poetry breaks grammar rules and poetry makes you feel something. They'll skip a million lines. They might have one yeah. word on a line. They might do all caps, like they break rules to make you feel something. And if you're going to break guide or brand guidelines, it needs to be with a purpose. Yeah. Uh, it can't just be like a careless thing. Like there needs to be a method to the madness. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I would compare it to like breaking grammar rules in poetry. Uh, if, if it's all for that greater good of making someone feel something, then consider it. Uh, don't go rogue. Go through the proper <laughs> channels, check right. with your creative director. Yeah. Well, like that sign that I held up, right, with the piece of paper. Obviously, I didn't write that messaging in our font, but I made sure that our real logo was on there. I didn't hand draw our logo. So there was still a level of brand recognition, and it's our approved copy messaging. So that's like an example of, I'm not going to put our font there, but I made sure that the copy and the logo and everything was still represented. Mm -hmm.